Poetry Month. Right. Yay. Yay! There's only what ten more? Eleven days left of Poetry Month. I'm not math is not my strong suit. All back to Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Amy Cunningham, and I have the great pleasure of being a volunteer board member here at the Kellogg Hubbard Library, this wonderful institution. Uh, the wonderful institution who uh, are the presenters and creators of this poem city, which is, yay! <laughs> now in its 10th year, uh, and I wanna thank some, some organizations who make that possible, the National Life Group Foundation, the Vermont Humanities Council, uh, Hunger Mountain Co-op, uh, the Vermont College of Fine Arts, and the Poetry Society of Vermont are all to thank in putting together our Poem City productions every year. So we really appreciate their support. Um, another hat I wear in my life is the Deputy Director of the Vermont Arts Council. Uh, and so I'd be remiss if I didn't take a minute just to let you know that in this month of celebrating poetry, this is also the month every four years where we're taking nominations for a new Poet Laureate. Uh, and nominations are open until I think it's next Thursday. So this seems, I can't think of a better audience to uh, ask you to recruit and think of, of new nominees who have very big shoes to fill uh, for the next four year term. Tonight, uh, tonight's reading, as you know, is with uh, some of the poets who are featured in Roads Taken, Contemporary Vermont Poets, published in 2017, and Samantha from Bear Pond, has copies to sign if you don't have your copy yet. Um, and I am pleased tonight to, to introduce uh, Chard Denord and Sid Lee. Um, Chard earned a BA in Religious Studies from Lynchburg College, a Master's of Divinity from Yale Divinity School, and an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop. He's a co-founder of the New England College MFA program in poetry. He's the author of several books of poetry, including I Would Lie to You If I Could, Interviews with 10 American Poets, published by the University of Pittsburgh Press in 2018, and Chard, as you all know, is our current Poet Laureate of Vermont. It's my pleasure also to introduce Sid Lee, who is a Poet Laureate of Vermont from 2011 to 2015. His most recent collection of poems, No Doubt the Nameless, is available from Four Way Books. His fourth collection of lyrical essays, What's the Story? Short Takes on a Life Grown Long, was published in 2016 by Vermont's Green Writers Press, which in 2017 produced Roads Taken Contemporary Vermont Poets, the anthology that Chard and Sid um, co-edited together. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you, I'm the, uh, the older and better looking of the former Poet, Lower, as my daughter called it immediately when I got the phone call, it said, oh, that's pronounced poet low rate. Uh, at any rate, uh, this has been a wonderful uh, undertaking for me, as, as I think it has been for Chard. We didn't know each other terribly well. We'd read before, I think, at the Brattleberry Literary Festival, and uh, each of us had been approached independently to do an anthology of Vermont poetry, and each of us said, well, I don't know, we got other things to do. And I can't even remember the details about how it came to pass that a collaboration was conceived. And uh, it was a, a great delight for any number of reasons. Uh, one was that I got to know Chard and whose poetry I'd already admired and I came to like him very much and consider him a good friend now by virtue of a lot of collaboration over a couple of years. Uh, and uh, what was really uh, extraordinary, I think, about uh, the collaboration was that we didn't have any, you know, conflict over the selection of poems. Uh, we asked each uh, uh, poet, and the list is growing, as people like Ralph Culver is here, uh, publish new books, they will be invited to join uh, the ranks of these uh, poets. Uh, we each uh, asked, we asked each poet to contribute five poems, uh, of which we would select two, and we, Almost inevitably, I think there was one instance that I can remember, and I'll name the names, uh, in which we disagreed about which of the two to take and publish. And I think that's a pretty remarkable <clears throat> thing, so that uh, the uh, uh, poetry gods uh, blessed us uh, in, uh, in being able to get along, not only personally, but also aesthetically. Um, and what we're going to do tonight is uh, 
I'm simply going to read the introductions uh, of, of the poets who will who will read, and we're and and we're following uh, 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 not terribly originally. We're just going to do alphabetical order because at least I am not smart enough uh, to do it otherwise. And uh, and uh, Char will introduce our first uh, reader. Thank you, Amy and Sid. It's, it's wonderful being here, and uh, thank you all for coming out. Um, yes, this, this was a wonderful undertaking, and uh, I can't really remember either how it started. It just started, um, and we decided that it was just a good idea since there's so many wonderful poets uh, in Vermont. I think um, uh, Vermont's um, poetic legacy is probably as strong, if not stronger, than any other state that I, that I can think of. Um, you know, beginning uh, with Robert Frost up to the present as far as contemporary poets. So this, this anthology does begin with Robert Frost and continues right up to the present. And I think Dee Dee Cummings, who published this uh, book and has been such a wonderful editor in Vermont especially, um, is up for doing even a third edition. So we'll, we'll keep um, uh, adding uh, folks uh, to, to this book. Uh, our criteria was pretty simple um, to um, to um, solicit work from poets who had at least one book out and who'd lived in Vermont for five years. And so, you know, we, we've discovered, what, three or four more poets uh, since this book came out? And there are about 96 poets in here. Or had long-term seasonal or, relations. Right, long-term seasonal. You know, there are a lot of poets who just move up here from Tennessee and New York and all over and live here for long periods. You know, Robert Penn Warren, for instance, uh, who died in Stratford and is buried there. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first poet uh, tonight, who is David Cavanaugh, who lives up in Burlington and has worked at Johnson, now um, Northern Vermont University, for many years. Uh, he's the author of four books of poems, uh, including Straddle, The Middleman, and Falling Bo Body, all from Salmon Poetry, uh, which is a wonderful publisher in Ireland, uh, and Crying in Plato's Cave, uh, from apparently um, didn't make it out of Plato's Cave there. Uh, from Formite Press. David's poems have also appeared in leading journals and anthologies around the country and in Ireland. Um, he's a native of Canada, uh, and he lives, as I said, in Burlington. David, come on up. Thanks very much, Tard. And thanks to both you and Sid for putting together this really beautiful anthology and for bringing together so many poets in one place, probably the place where they're most comfortable together. <laughs> uh, they do mostly get along. You know. I thought you meant the library. <laughs> <laughs> that too, that's right. Um, I'll, I'll read a poem of mine from the anthology uh, and then a few other poems as well. This poem's called The Iceman, and there's a preamble. Can you hear me all right? It's fine. Yeah. There's a short preamble to it. In 1991, he was found inside a glacier of the Alps. Seems he had been out walking. An x-ray found an arrowhead in his back. He was 5,300 years old. The Iceman. If he had known his stroll by an alpine lake would be his last, how the arrow from behind would thud into his daydream, how the lake would claim him, harden, how anthropologists would pore over his Neolithic self the way his own kin hovered with stone knives over a kill, ready to skin, dismember, eat. If he were fast-tracked five millennia, would he say, what are you looking at? What do you want to know? Where fire comes from? Or, hey, where can I get some of those sneakers? <laughs> or, I am no source. I am an omen. The way one of us, blindsided, <clears throat> mangled by a muscle car running the light, might face the maker calmly, nothing more to prove, might say, I don't want in, just want you to know what I've been through in case you want to learn something. You gods, such know-it-alls. Most of all, would he have wanted a word with his mate left that morning by a hearth? What tenderness, what worry, 
might have furrowed that big brow. reminds me of a cartoon in The New Yorker where the author is at the front reading a book and there are people in the audience and there's a sign that says author reading and, and, and the caption is, isn't he supposed to say something? <laughs> Great cartoon. Ah, here we go. Waitress I never knew. Hair-lipped, you were beautiful. Loon lonely eyes and lithe shapes split by the veering renegade lip, asymmetrical, utterly stirring. After the surgery, I wasn't even sure it was you, so nearly regular, your mouth, just a hint of up-pull, so flashing, your look. You seemed younger, less sad, less sure, too, as if you had become your own little sister. How I wanted that wildly rising line still to be there. I had no right. I know your life is better now. Hear it in the loose swing of your chatter. But your <clears throat> glance, more flit than flash. Something has been smoothed away, I loved. At least one self wrenched from bed by thugs you never <clears throat> knew, hustled off, never seen again. Now it is left to find out what was lost in that line you were born with. What became of the disappeared? What grace resides in that thin river you no longer have to cross? And where it may be found again? And why I worry so? <clears throat> Quantum jump. This is my science poem, so I hope there aren't too many science people in the world because in the room, uh-oh, I'll be really in trouble. Uh, so one of the debates in, in physics had, has had to do with um, whether light travels in a straight line consisting of particles or whether it moves in waves. And turned out through various experiments, and Einstein was involved in some of this, uh, that it actually does both at the same time. And so how could that be? Um, so we're talking here about very tiny, we're talking about subatomic particles, really tiny stuff. Well, I kind of expanded it to think about human things, which is scientifically absolutely preposterous. <laughs> but there you go. Quantum jump. The wave that crashes on the rocks is made of particles that behave so much like waves the scientists scratch their individual heads until their one bobbing mass and their voices rise like spray. Certain, uncertain, certainly we are all going to die one day probably <laughs> is about all with precision we can say. No one has ever not done it and I don't aim to be the first. Not that I lack ambition, only that aiming doesn't seem to help. Still, smack the tennis ball against the wall often enough, it could one time go straight through. So I say unto you, phone the woman, plant the rare hibiscus, most likely it won't take, except when it does. And this is a, a new one, newish. Seems somehow to have a relationship to that last one that I read, but I'm not quite sure what that is. 
the perfect peach. You keep trying to say something important. And by you, I mean me, but you probably know that. The harder you try, the more something important skips away, laughing so hard it trips over another something important somebody left behind because it was too hot or hard or heavy or boring. To put it another way, because another way is really what you're after, you keep swinging for the fences while reality beats out grounders for singles and steals second on a wild pitch or gets thrown out in a tense tangle of dust, gloves, and cleats. Everybody loves a slugger, but nobody cares in the end who struck out mightily every time. It might be great to be a dying hero, except for the dying part. There was something important you were trying to say, some single thing that matters like anything, like all get out, like nobody's business. But wait, look at that splendid peach suddenly before you, just daring to be eaten. You bet its juice would run down your chin and snake like a tributary of a great river, the Mississippi maybe, down through your chest hairs, cool, wet, a little sticky a perfect peach that hangs still and bright in the patient air, ready to be smashed right out of the park. <laughs> and I'll end with this, and thanks very much. Since Sunday is Easter, I'm, I'm not a believer, but I I do have some sort of belief in resurrection and hunting for eggs. Uh, this is called The Hunt. On the Easter before there was Easter, Jesus rolled back a rock and went home looking for something perfect, like an egg, to hold up to his dad, delighted. Then came thousands of Mondays with their here we go again. But oh, that pop-up Easter urge to heave back the stone, race free and find the hidden treat, scour behind couches or the silent trees out back for something we're not even sure is there. To find is sweet, but the pulsing drive to seek, the giddy hope of here, dad, see what I found. Take it now, the lost egg of endless urge. Eat and rejoice. Let's do it again in memory and in need. Thank you. There were a, a couple of poets uh, whom we invited to be here tonight who at the virtual 11th hour uh, had conflicts which uh, keep them from being here. And uh, so um, one of them is uh, Major Jackson, whom I suspect most of you know or know of, uh, recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship, National Endowment for the Arts, creator of Artist Fellowship of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced <coughs> Study at Harvard University, published poems and essays in many journals, and been included in several volumes of Best American Poetry. He's the University Distinguished Professor and Richard Dennis Green M. Gold Professor at the University of Vermont, and he's the uh, poetry editor at Harvard Review. And I'm going to read a poem of Major's called The Enchanters of Addison County, which is in the anthology. We were more than gestural, close listening, the scent of manure writing its waft on the leaves off Route 22A. By nightfall, our gaze flecked like loon cries, but no one was up for turnips nor other roots, not we, least of which the, the clergy. Romanticism has its detractors, which is why we lined the road with tea-lit luminaries and fresh-cut lemons. We called it making magic. Then stormed the corners and porches of general stores, kissing whenever cars idled at four-way stop signs or sought grade-A maple syrup in tin containers with painted scenes of horse-drawn farmers plowing through snow. The silhouetted, rusted farm equipment gave us the laid-back heaven we so often wished, 
and fireflies bequeath Earth stars, such blink and blank and bunk a bunk bunk. And of course, we wondered if we existed, and also, too, the cows of the ancient pastures and the white milk inside our heads, like church spires and ice cream cones. Even after all of that cha-cha-cha, we still came out of swimming holes, shivering our hearts out. I'm, uh, I, one of my favorite introductions I ever heard was uh, by the great jazz trumpeter Dizzy Gillespie, who was introducing a new member of his band, and he said, I'd like to turn you over to a young man who's without a doubt. Then he walked off the stage. <laughs> um, and, uh, although uh, my friend Jeff would admit that he's not, uh, not, no longer young, but I, that, that might serve for Jeff. Most of you know him. A lot of people in the state know him. Uh, he's just been a tireless campaigner and ambassador for poetry in Vermont, taught tirelessly in schools throughout the state for decades, while well, publishing and performing his own work in venues as diverse as Harper's, the Paris Review, Exquisite Corpse, the Whitney Museum, and the Honolulu Zoo. He teaches at the Delta Greek program at Vermont College and serves as writing secondary English consultant to the Vermont Department of Education. 1995, Hahnemann published his first book for teachers, a portfolio primer, teaching, collecting, and assessing student writing. An old man without a doubt. <laughs> I can't help wondering what happened to that poem, the one poem that Sid and Chard butted heads over. <laughs> and I keep hoping it made it into the anthology and not only that, I pray that it's mine. <laughs> but we'll never know. None of us were winners like Armin Trout or B.B., the heavyweight, who surprised opponents twice his size in the unlimited division, flipping one who still scowled from the peevish handshake that had to start each match. Spring weekend, my parents drove my date up from New Jersey, and I wrestled the 135-pounder from Petty, who took 30 seconds to pin me spring weekend the year before. My father clapped my back in the locker room and pronounced it a moral victory. <laughs> Behind the gym, two weeks later, the hacks on the team smoked their first cigarettes since fall and chafed at the gung hoes who were still running laps. Where are they now? Well, Armand Trout's big in business for sure. And Beebe's a famous neurosurgeon. And us hackers? I'll hazard our wages per capita can't touch theirs. We were artists, idealists, the boys who invented wrestling to lose. <laughs> Slam yourself down on the mat with shoulders flat. Hold your opponent just three seconds over you, helpless in the victory pose. <laughs> and this is toilet knuckles. It relates to my grandchildren, and it's my other poem in this Amazing, thank you, anthology. Toilet knuckles. That's what the kids called bagels. Toilet knuckles. <laughs> brothers. Brothers with a language built on inflection and direct metaphor. None of this waffling typical of similes. Brothers that hunt 
together, and when they sing without rehearsal, their voices blend and the tone is true. No gimmicks, except that secret language of the almost imperceptibly curled lip or the double beat of eyelids only the other feels and note how I didn't say sees or notices. We are outsiders in the deepest sense made deeper by our jealousy. Coming from the lake, not mosquitoes, but those jet skis where the person stands, a modern miracle I can walk on. But the big grin and yell disappear. If he'd only been looking where he was going, the <laughs> pier didn't budge. And to help us feel better, the doctor said he never knew he was dead. You think I make this up for the cheap burlesque? Do I even wonder if I'm inventing it? Answer, no. It comes from a higher power, a gift that flows through, as Colin said, when all the ducks are in a row. It's not your everyday occurrence like when you read in the paper someone you didn't know has hit the pier or is circling the drain, as the British doctors say, when the patient is not expected to last through the next pay period. <laughs> it's a crime. We have to laugh to make ourselves feel better when, after all, we didn't exactly ask to be here in the first place, a little late night fun or an unexpected quickie and you are summoned, then become attached through suffocating unexpected times, months before bursting out to breathe, to walk with the moon on your back and step to the shadows of your feet watching Mars begin to tire of its ascent. Don't ask the Martians what they want or if they chose to exist. We thought them up. Poor things, not likely joviated through tickling and lusty pleasure, but creatures of imagination and thus too real to contemplate. We're the only ones. God told us so. Turning as the asphalt path becomes the parking lot, I walked backwards in the fresh, empty space, eyes square on the man who, in spite of being called the moon, has never shown his backside. He's done a month's duty as long as history, year after year, keeping inconstant but reliable watch on us, a servant of sorts, especially to lovers who find excuse in his majesty to behave like bunnies. I shifted focus to the lake and saw how deep, steep water holds the clouds, the sky, the moon, and Mars in spite of itself descending deeper. Today I am thinking about unconditional love. And it's opposite. Like, what are my conditions? I can love everyone in this room, at least those who haven't returned to cocktail chatter or the summons of a cell phone. So there's a condition. 
and a pretty serious one, too. I mean, what it says about me. You know, I'm wondering about you. Is my condition wider spread than I know? Maybe it's all of us. Today, I am writing a pound of poems. That's one pound tear. <laughs> Weight of paper excluded. You can tell from the quality they were scribbled in a mad, extended rush to express a whole pound of ink. Oh, my aching hand. Today, the snow falls endlessly, gobs of miniature snowballs late for the party that has blanketed everything drooped the branches still hanging heavy with the stuff that dropped last week. Or was it Sunday? Thank you. <laughs> I was uh, unaware of our next poet until her book, Landscape with, with uh, Plywood Figures, isn't that right? Yeah, um, was uh, submitted as a, a nominee for the uh, Vermont Book Award. And I got these books and I said, well, I had some convictions about who really would win. And then I read this book I hadn't been familiar with, with uh, Karen's uh, uh, Plywood Silhouettes uh, before. And then uh, I think she won pretty much by acclamation that year. So. Uh, She's, uh, I continue to be a fan ever since. She's the winner of the 2015 Vermont Book Award and the 2013 New Issues Poetry Prize, recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowship, and a graduate of the MFA program for writers at Warren Wilson. She lives and teaches right here in town. Karen. everyone. What a handsome crew. <laughs> Thanks for coming out. And thank you so much for this reading and for the anthology and um, the work that everyone does all the time in the name of poems. Um, I'm still getting used to the fact that I have to change glasses between everything I do. So I'm a little, I can't see you at all. So you can make any kind of faces you like. <laughs> but I can see these poems. So we'll see how we do. Um, the first book, the first poem I'm going to read is called Passerines, and I'm, uh, can you hear me okay? Okay. Yes. Um, thinking, uh, this was a trip I took to Paris, and my daughter and I were outside Notre Dame, and there was a man there who um, teaches people, he puts his hand out and gives you bird seed, and the birds feed from your hand, mm -hmm. and it's an enduring memory of mine. The poem kind of circles around that, so. Passerines. I want to tell you about the thud against the back door that my man says bird, that later we see its tail sticking out from underneath the siding, that its tail feathers shine like oil, shifting purple to blue, and we are kneeling on the wet decking, the yellow of its stomach making it something more than the brown birds everywhere, a tiny prize for kneeling there, for prying back the vinyl siding to find a yellow-bellied flycatcher, its cheek bloodied. I want to tell you how he held it, said passerine before it took flight. Little passerine, songbird. Before she left, I brought my daughter to saint Genet. There were swallows like boomerangs near dark, like here, like everywhere I go. I want to tell you about the neighbor, the scientist, who said they were swifts, not swallows. Swallows are passerines, but swifts are not. Passerine, I thought. Passerine, a more future verb tense for to pass, a tense I can't know yet, a passing I can't understand. The order passerine is a mess, the scientist said. It's impossible to track its evolution. I want to tell you I don't understand evolution, any of it, even mine, becoming the mother I will be next, the one who lets go. 
Once I stood on a bridge and a man taught me to call sparrows to eat from my hands, told me he was a sinner, that what he did for me was atonement, which is a thing I might understand. I want to tell you there is nothing like their tiny grip, the way they quiver while they peck at your palm, wanting to fly out of reach. I want to tell you what happened when I let her go, but I don't understand it yet. I want to talk about this morning, the little yellow bird in sudden dizzy flight, the trees full of yellow, how I lost sight. I'm thinking a lot about um, having grown up Catholic and some of the imagery of Catholicism as I work on my next book. And this poem is called A Hagiography, hey and I, I love the stories of the saints. Um, a Hagiography. Hey Heads will roll, we say, when shit gets bad, but they don't anymore. No more St. Alban, his head rolling downhill into a well, the water turning holy. Saint Elunid, her head rolling downhill into a stone, from which springs a healing well. Ditto Saint Winifred, beheaded by a suitor who wants her, but she loves God, her head rolling downhill, upspringing a healing well where it stops. But swift, Saint ba swift uncle Saint Beuno reattaching her head, but still she was ready to die. Where was St. Denis going when he walked downhill into Paris, holding his head in his own hands? Where does a man go with his head in his hands? And what sermon does he give, this man gone walking and praying, having played chicken without backing down from men with swords, scourged and racked? What is there to say? When I walk into his Sacre Coeur and walk a circle around its stations, I have nothing to say. The sumac that grows along the highways where I live, it catches me driving past, its branches circling up to the sky like the slowest motion dance. Its droops, its extra stretch toward the sky's fine blue ceiling. The sumac, a patient whirling dervish. I walk my sacre coeur circle, thinking of the trash mound of its foundation, the cathedral stretching up away from Paris, my, fa my face wet because I wouldn't die for any kind of faith, the not even sumac reach of my heart. <coughs> I'll read two more poems. Awake. This morning, <clears throat> before I read this poem, I'll clear my throat. <clears throat> Awake. This morning, I bramble toward waking Alarm, 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 snarling my dreams, like little girls around a pile of marbles, arguing quitsies, no quitsies. This morning, I don't know. This morning, I am lagging with my dead, reminding them they have already gone first. I knuckle down on the day, make strides and comebacks. I ride a train and, re keep, and write and keep crossing out the word rather. I never know what I want until afternoon, and sometimes trim the walkway instead of thinking. I pull the curtain on who I am, keep shame for my sleeping like a terrarium of whistles. Somewhere, someone finds me phenomenal. I stand so tall and keep the future as a pet. Together, we swim the headwaters like children who don't know the rules. I forget who is playing for fair and who for keeps. And this last poem is for my brother, who I lost this fall um, to an overdose. Um, it's, a, it's a pernicious epidemic, that's for sure. And when it strikes home, it really, it really hits hard. It's called losing. My brother is lost. I can't find my brother. I say it over again, when I lost my brother. A back road I knew once and now can't find a specific wave on John's pond. The last one we saw there, the blue-lipped sleep of overdose. He goes from one office to the next, and no one will return my calls. One day, he was somewhere. I know he must have been. The difference in weight between alive and dead. 
Do the old experiment again. Weigh the escaped soul. Let it have gone somewhere. Let it have packed one bag. Is my brother any amount of atoms at all, fending for themselves? If I keep saying, I have lost my brother, is there a corollary? Do I make wayfinding, a compass, a geocache, a crashed plane on his island, his black box full of laughter? Every next syllable said by everyone is my brother. Silent mouths, these are where dead brothers live. I keep a jar of nails like a bouquet of denial. Life ends with us finding leaves underfoot. Fend for ourselves, I'm saying. There is music everywhere. There must be a bit of his breath left. Put the needle in the track again. My brother somewhere knows the tune. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Gives me great pleasure to introduce Liz Powell to you next. She's a poet of many talents. I should say writer of many talents, because she not only writes wonderful poems, but she writes fiction as well. Uh, and she's um, one of the state's um, uh, best editors at, at, the, um, uh, for, at the Green Mountain Review. She's the author of The Republic of Self, a new issue's first book prize winner uh, the, uh, um, of that, and was the, which was selected by C.K. Williams. Her second book of poems, I also love her titles, uh, Willie Loman's Reckless Daughter, Living Truthfully Under Imaginary Circumstances. Uh, that, that was just waiting to be written about, and she's the first real one to really to pick up on it and uh, write just so beautifully about it. Won the uh, 2016 Anhinja Robert Dana Prize, selected by Maureen Seaton. She's the editor of the Green Mountain Review, as I said, an associate professor of creative writing at Northern Vermont University, and has also serves on the faculty of the residency program at the University of Nebraska, Omaha. And um, Liz, could you tell me the title of your novel? Concerning the Holy Ghost Interpretation of J. Crew Catalog. I hope and she's going to repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful title. Please welcome Liz Powell. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Chard, and thank you, Sid. Thank you both for all your work on Birds Taken. It's a great anthology. And thank you all for being here um, and helping to celebrate <coughs> Poetry Month. I'll read um, the two poems that I have in the anthology, and then I'll read some new poems. Uh, I have a book coming out next year called Atomizer with um, Louisiana State University Press, and so I'll read some of those. The first one I'll, I'll read is called From the Book of Condolences. The book forewarned, you may have visions. You may think you hear your dead parents speaking in the courtyard. On page 15, the book comforted. Life is a process of second-guessing oneself. It uncannily predicted you may be completely screwed. It offered irony and canned laughter. Ha, ha, ha. It gave dubious advice. Wait, there may be a way out, but the door has premonitions, and it's very fragile. It asked, knock, knock, who's there? On the cover, a picture. The dead, tiptoeing, startled like ballerinas. The book warned, it is the pain of the absence of the body you will fear. It provided a clue. Beware of a goblet filled to the brim with agony. It whistled, the far water remembers. It pools and sings of the ransacker. The punchline was always, do not drink the story. Uh, I don't know if you remember People's Express that used to fly to Burlington from Newark in the 1980s for $19. And I was in high school, and I used to take that a lot. And Newark used to just be a little hole in the wall airport. And now it's quite grand. And I was there recently, and it's like the CBGB's shop, <laughs> which I thought was kind of ridiculous and wonderful. Um, anyway, so this one's called At the Swatch Watch Store in Newark's Terminal C. 
I'm going home. I look at swatch watches, at a store of timepieces for people who wait. Once there was a purple inside space called Deep of Night, where God's amygdala made time. The Newark moon did not shine. No travel delays, all's fine. The past kept living inside me like a cheap Timex. Where are you going? The store clerk said. But I heard my father in my head, dragging me from bed to bone voyage me out of Newark when this terminal was merely stairs, no moving sidewalks, when we were people still, not consumers, flying $19 flights into Burlington, Vermont on People's Express. Get your ass on the plane, my long dead father still waving me goodbye in his very white voice in a bubble floating above me like a cartoon or a synapse or a brain protein. You're making me late for an important meeting. Scotch still in my pores like milliseconds, collecting for takeoff into minutes. Oh, briefcase, the wild blue yonder song he used to sing to me on my own. Then, now, a store of timepieces for those who wait. Once Amelia Earhart dedicated this airfield and hangar deep inside God's amygdala, I tick tock. I'm going, I'm going, and he's gone into a parade of pinstripes into the vast importance of commerce. I hold a swatch watch. It has a big cherubic face that says 1111. The angels are watching. They haven't aged. My hand to God's portal. So after writing Willie Loman's Reckless Daughter, I was really happy not to write any more elegies. <laughs> But I was still thinking uh, about what it means to be grow up as a, a, a girl in this society. Um, we used to play a lot of Miss America, and one of the things we had to do was walk with books on our heads. And I tell this to my children now, and they're like, you did what? <laughs> um, but anyway, so this is called The Girl from Ipanema. It's a song that was always playing in my house growing up. The Girl from Ipanema walked up to me all the way from Brazil to serenade my childhood. All day it was Jao Gilberto and Bossa Nova. The samba sang only to me, no one else. Yet a voice like my mother's began to sing. How can he tell her he loves her? The music petitioning the afternoon for mercy, and then the promise. She looked straight ahead, not at him. My toes in the cold Atlantic Blender making music on Fire Island. My father's long coffee-colored fingers smelling of limes. The grown-ups fading into the afternoon's vanishing point. I dragged the red wagon down the sandy lane where I walked mixture of flower and mermaid bosa, Gilberto and Getz's sonic thump toward the year of my undoing. Inside the high notes of my long hair, tangling off key in beach wind and radio sounds. The song sang of the one chord Gilberto had played over and over, locked in his bathroom that year when everything was changing. How to understand the new sound of beauty. How a young girl disappeared into an idea of a person no one can have. a poem I wrote for uh, my friend Angie Palm, who's a creative nonfiction writer. Um, she's very beautiful and young and vivacious and smart and brilliant, and I always like to call her the young Elizabeth Taylor of nonfiction. <laughs> so that's the reference there. OK, it's called Burlington is Nuts Today. Every day is a hipster convention. Girls with $300 jeans. She sports her Adifa t-shirt and cork-heeled shoes. I agree with her, but, but, but. I would like some $300 jeans. <laughs> I think of the Scots ballad Sir Patrick spends. I have grown impatient. Fake farmers in overalls selling their window-grown wheatgrass. I'm stuck in a huge backup of cars that want into our taxpayer-funded parking garage for people who only use credit cards. This used to be Vermont. Now I'm on the Upper West Side. I keep pushing the button for a ticket. 
Moms with unsymmetrical haircuts drag their spoiled children in Birkenstocks toward home, where the world was ending on CNN just moments ago. A white dude on snack wretches junk sick into a trash can. A handsome professor in Danish glasses, briefcase, looks on disapproving. I fear I am getting fat and vulnerable. I think mean, in a bad mood, no longer pretty, no, able, no longer able to use my pink self for what I want and don't want. My name itself makes a scratchy sound. The dude who was my 100% match online and is unattainable says he smashes patriarchy too. <laughs> I myself am skunked. The construction guy crunches toward the hard core of his lunch almost over. His rich parents in Canada funded his grad degree with high hopes, but I'm late for coffee with the young Elizabeth Taylor of nonfiction. I like to witness her youth and hope she gets everything she thinks she wants. Later tonight, Rachel Maddow will pull up the shade only to find more darkness. The world is ending. Boy Scouts, hippies, take a ticket, have it validated since you can't be. Short-term parking is full. Now please pull the ticket out. Proceed. <laughs> And um, I'll read one more. It's called The Idiot Box, right? Some of you had parents who called the television set that. The television was like an extra sibling. My kids don't believe me when I say we had one TV. It was this big by this big. And um, we fought over it a lot. Anyway, so the epigram of this poem is, if you can't all agree on what to watch, I'm going to throw this goddamn thing out the window. Um, and it's attributed to Mother, 1978. <laughs> The TV says it will love me if only, and the TV says earthquake in Japan. The TV asks how many are injured. The TV tells me I will vote for Hillary because I'm X age with Y beliefs and I don't use the C word. The TV warns me of erections lasting more than four hours and wants us all to have bathtubs with mountain views. The TV sings the national anthem and uncovers crying babies needing Gerber baby food that nothing else will help. The TV tells me not to read the New York Times. For a moment, I have to agree with the TV. The TV has some new jingles that have a backbeat with a secret message that will make me do wonderful things if only I would just listen. The TV confirms my worst fears. I have spent too much on my life insurance policies. The TV implies George Clooney is the smartest man left on earth, but I know this not to be true. The TV agrees with George Clooney, that only women half their age can suck their big fat dicks. The TV says, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, the TV says a man came out of nowhere wearing a hoodie. The TV asks me why I believe in white privilege. The TV implores me to shave my genitals. The TV prefers breast meat and has found a way for everything to be breast meat. The TV asks me to consider having people from other cultures over to my house to eat frozen pizza and drink wine from long stem glasses that I can buy not far from here, that it will make me more interesting. The TV says, don't leave me. I can be anyone. The TV says, I remember you as a child, how sad and lonely you were, how bereft. The TV says I should stop trying to make sense of what it is saying, that to do so will increase my blood pressure, cause tingly feet, perhaps fainting. The TV is downloading a better self inside myself, and for this I try to be grateful. The TV tries to understand irony. The TV says it is the mother I never had. The TV calms my stomach. The TV is having a tumultuous affair with Donald Trump and blames me for watching. The TV knows exactly how much I don't know. The TV believes in loud public music and not just in elevators anymore. The TV will deliver me flowers for the meal it shows me how to throw together. The TV will make my hair curly. The TV has dogs who really speak and babies too. The TV tells me not to tell anybody what the TV says, and the TV has turned the family into an audience. The TV says sportsmanship at values.com. The TV says large plastic bags with lots of plastic shit. The TV says a tiger killed a zookeeper. The TV says blonde hair, big boobs. The TV is obsessed with breasts, not just breast meat. The TV tells me it remembers when I was crazy in the rocking chair with postpartum and how it kept me company by keeping me scared. And the TV said your life in minutes, hours, seconds, and the TV put a Band-Aid on my eyeball. And the TV combs my hair and sings to me in its white angelic voice and the TV uses a strategy of indirection. The TV says the Russian prostitute said so. The TV makes like its friends with Jane Goodall, Big Pappy, Obama, the old blue hairs down the street. I've known the TV for 45 years now, and it has watched me pee, cry, cook, fuck, clean. Sometimes I'm not sure who the voyeur is anymore. The TV who remembers my dead mother to me, how she threatened to throw it out the window a long time ago now. 
but that TV is dead too, long having coke poured into its vents by my irate brother watching Howard Cosell narrate the wild world of sports, and a knob that <laughs> fell off into nowhere when, no, when one of us was stoned, and the TV says that old TV is probably space junk now in outer space, catching cable signals for free, avoiding those Russians, and the TV says that little TV is never coming back, so I should quit crying about it, and the TV says nostalgia isn't flattering, that back in the day I took my mother literally, and it scared me. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, you see the variety in this uh, book, uh, although those aren't in the book. We'll try to include those in the next edition. <laughs> um, I'm going to read uh, just a, a poem by Veranda. Do you know, how many of you know Veranda Porch? I think a lot of you do, and unfortunately she couldn't be here this evening because um, a Seder is tomorrow. She's, she's uh, up early tomorrow to prepare for a Seder, and unfortunately couldn't get back in time for it. So I'm just going to say a few words about Randy. You, you all know her. Um, uh, so she doesn't need a long introduction, but um, I'll just say that she's been really a kind of poet saint in this <coughs> state for so many years, traveling around, reading, dedicating her life to poetry in schools and recording um, uh, people's life stories in nursing homes. Um, and um, of course, writing her own poetry. Um, and she's just tireless. And I, I don't know, I know her well because she lives in southern Vermont, uh, where she gets her, her energy and her inspiration. And uh, it's just, it's unslaked and relentless and inspiring. She's the poet in residence and performer and writing partner. Uh, well, that's what she is, uh, as well as um, a, a, a wonderful poet. She's published uh, two books, Sudden Eden, The Body Symmetry. Um, and um, she's now working with a songwriter and performer, Patty Carpenter, and they tour the state singing and performing. She received an honorary doctorate from Marlboro College. Her current project is Shedding Light on the work, a Working Forest, a collaboration with painter Kathleen Kolb, which uh, she finished, she completed that, and did, did a beautiful um, uh, uh, a presentation, or actually a show with her at the Brattleboro Museum, um, and also in Northern uh, Woods, the Vermont, uh, wonderful Vermont magazine about the woodlands. Um, so I'm going to read this poem of Veranda's called Kitchen Hints, Not to Enter Winter Empty-Handed. One, hold a candle to a mirror, spell out the lover's name in tallow, dip a spatula in water. If brittle letter blobs chilled on silver, one won't lift evenly set him aside. Two, fill a black sky speckled kettle with a rolling boil, steam quart jars, can light, seal, and cool. Three, take a, take a cleaver to a red cabbage, thunk, choose half, ink its imprint, dense violet strata, curved around a geologic core, pull yourself together, Shred the clean side for a tart slaw. Serve. Four. Root for your future. Bring daughters into wind. Bend to the field. Watch their white hands numb and gladden around red potatoes. Dig for our ancestors. See with your fingers. Quick work. Frost, snow, false alarm. Five. Squash song. Simmer forever, my delicata. Two-toned, thick-skinned winter keeper. Why take a lifetime to be tender? Beside, you wet the wet seeds burn. So that's uh, that's Veranda. She's she's writing now. I can just see her down there. Um, so it gives me also a great pleasure. I'm going to introduce uh, Sid Lee uh, to you next, and um, and then um, I'll read after. After Sid, so let me. I just would like to say a few words before I mention his many accomplishments. He's just he's been such a wonderful friend, uh, mentor, collaborator in this project, uh, and um, I I uh, I just I just can't say enough about 
how um, supportive and inspiring he's, he's been to me throughout these last uh, three years. It's hard to believe that it's been three years, both as a co-editor of this as well as, um, uh, as, well as, as a poet. Um, I've read many of his recent poems in magazines such as Plume, uh, the Poetry Journal, and they actually make me make me weep. He's, uh, they, they, um, they have this wonderful combination of elegance, formality, and you know, what John Keats called negative capability, which is that ability to be in uncertainty, mystery, doubt, without any irritable reaching after fact or reason, and that's that's really. <laughs> hard to pull off, um, and, he, and he does it with such <laughs> grace and elegance, as I said. Um, so um, just to read uh, you a quick bio, though, um, Sid um, was the Poet Laureate, uh, as Amy mentioned, from 2011 to 2015. He's the author of 20 books, 12 of which are poetry, and the most recent collection of poems is No Doubt the Nameless. Actually, he's got this new book out with four-way book. Uh, he was founder and longtime editor of the New England Review. He taught at Dartmouth College, Yale, Middlebury, and several European universities before his retirement. He also um, went to Yale, received his PhD there, and um, people don't mention this much, but he's one of the best Wordsworth scholars in the country, Sidley. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, that's, uh, I'm not going to be able to live up to that, I can tell you that right now. Um, I will read uh, a couple of really brand new poems, and then I'll read one from the uh, anthology. Uh, my beloved wife of four decades uh, had a shoulder operation in December, and it just hasn't gone well. And uh, she, uh, she had a second procedure. It was not surgery per se, but they knocked her out and manipulated her arm in the hope that it would re restore range of motion and, and uh, uh, give her some relief from the pain that she's had, which is interfered with her sleep. And that didn't work, so on Monday she'll have yet another uh, procedure. It's been going on since December, and she's uh, so upbeat and such a patient. Per we went in, when, when our old GP retired, we went in to see, uh, to meet the new one, and she asked us a series of questions, looked at our advanced di directives and pointed at my wife and said, Tigger, and pointed at me and said, Eeyore. Um, <laughs> uh, but at any rate, uh, this poem uh, was conceived uh, as I was waiting for it to come out of the second uh, uh, procedure. It's called Partners and Partners, Partners as in the old westerns, you know, partner. In the pre-op room, my wife was given a scalene block for a brief procedure. She had soldier surgery, shoulder surgery, three months back, and now again they'll anesthetize her to break up scars that have kept her in pain. She'll be comatose, however briefly. I remembered right off how one's love can seldom appear so precious as she does on a gurney. I feel what I felt on watching her labor giving birth, for instance. But I won't be on hand for this episode. I sit in the lobby alone, but for a fellow old man in a black cowboy hat who's waiting like me for a wife to come to. He plunges his fingers into her purse and digs around inside in search of what, I wonder. I can't decode his half audible mumbles or his face's expression. On the trip here from home, we hit black ice on a busy road in this busy small town. I pick up spun on ice and what passes for rush hour here. The fact we weren't hurt defies all reason, like grace. The man keeps probing and I keep wondering why. This looks still a deadpan. I know very well what it is to divert one's thoughts from hurtful or frightening matters, to seek what can lift us out of this world when it threatens to tear itself into tatters. How in the world can love torture us, though? Its pain seems deepened by the length of its years. An ambulance siren winds down outside. I've been reading to keep myself busy, but now I look up to find my cowpoke in tears. This one is called Neutrality. 
My wife hates this poem. She says, it's, a, it's, it's worse than pessimistic. Uh, it's, well, anyway, it's called neutrality. <laughs> I headed for high ground this morning, climbing a ridge against a freshet's flow whose April sound seemed less like song than yammer. The hill's flanks were slick and my scaling slow, and because of the steepness, I leaned my face close to earth, or rather to clotted leaves and rock, and so I noticed something I'd otherwise miss. The season's first red Fs. Last week, the snow fleas gathered on the southerly sides of tree trunks, but by now the fleas and snow have rushed off together. What's troubled me slightly since is how I responded to that tiny harbinger salamander. As earlier, I had to the fact that our Phoebe is back in the lilac, flicking her tail outside the nursery. We still call it nursery, though our children are long gone. You might think a man like me would so sorely miss them after all these years. And what of that pair of hooded mergansas afloat in the part of the pond that shows up in water? Signs in every quarter, spring and hope. To see them, I might have felt my old heart flutter, or I might have succumbed to despondency and doubt. What upsets me some is that I did neither. I attribute this to how my years stretch out, for which reason, contrarily, my poems grow shorter. This last one uh, is called uh, My Wife's Back. Um, I, it's, uh, well, I'm 76. I think when I was about 60, uh, my, uh, my knees just wouldn't let me run, using the term very loosely, uh, to keep myself more or less in shape. So I, uh, in a fit of what my youngest daughter, the, my severest and most witty critic, the one that called me Poet Lowrate, uh, uh, refers to as a fit of geezer madness, I took up the sport of uh, competitive flat water kayaking. And that's... Uh, uh, a good thing for me because it has no impact and also because in five minutes from where I live I can be on the Connecticut River and uh, uh, I just really enjoy it a lot. But in those interludes when I'm not pretending that I'm a lot younger than I am, uh, often I will go with said wife uh, in an open canoe down the river much more sanely and see what we can see. And uh, weight being what it is, she's always in the bow and I'm in the stern and uh, this remembers such a day. My wife's back, all naked but for a strap that traps my gaze as we paddle. The dear familiar nubs of spine bone punctuating that sun-warmed swath. The slender muscles that trouble the same sweet surface. We've watched and smiled as green herons flushed and hopped ahead of us at every bend. And we've looked up at a red tail tracing open scripts on a sky so clear and deep we might believe it's autumn, no matter, it's August still. Another fall will be on us before we know it. Of course, we adore that commotion of color, but it seems to come again as soon as it's gone away. They all do now. We're neither young anymore to put matters plainly. My love for you over 40 years extends in all directions, but just now to your back as we drift and paddle down the tranquil Connecticut River. We've seen a mink Scratch fleas on a mud flat. We've seen an osprey start to dive, but seeing us think better of it. Two Phoebes wagged on an ash limb. Your torso is long. I can't see your legs, but they're longer, I know. Phoebe, osprey, heron, hawk, marbles under black mountain. But I am fixed on your back, indifferent to other wonders. Bright minnows that flared in the shallows, the gleam off that poor mink's coat, even the fleas in its fur, the various birds, the lust of creatures just to survive. But I watch your back. Never have I wished more not to die. Thank you. And now I get a chance to reciprocate and, uh, and uh, introduce my colleague, Chard. Uh, uh, most of, uh, uh, of the original introduction, I don't know that I'll necessarily uh, repeat it. This new book uh, uh, of uh, his, uh, I'd Lie to You If I Could, is really fascinating. I mean, just as his prior interview book was, and I, I highly recommend that you, 
he's a wonderful interviewer. He even made me sound interesting, I think, once on an <laughs> interview down in the public access TV down there in Brattleboro with a wonderful conversation. Um, I, I will, um, I, so many of his accomplishment, uh, accomplishments have already been cited, but I think one thing that you should know about, and uh, I hope you'll be aware of, is that uh, he's a, a prime mover in the uh, 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 Ruth Stone Memorial Trust, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, a nonprofit, obviously, which is trying to uh, keep alive the extraordinary legacy of our predecessor. Uh, uh, one of our predecessors is Poet Laureate Ruth Stone, and uh, it's worth looking into. Uh, and I'm sure Richard would be happy to talk to you about it at length at any time. He lives in uh, Westminster West with his wife, uh, Liz, who is here, he's a marvelous artist. So please welcome Charlotte. Thank you, Sid. You are interesting. <laughs> that interview and your poetry and your life betray that. Um, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that about, about Ruth Stone. Um, I don't know if uh, you all have read much of Ruth's work. She didn't live that far from here, uh, over in Goshen and, and um, Brandon. Um, yeah, so uh, please just keep reading Ruth Stone. We're trying to restore her house. Uh, it's an 1830 house in Goshen that um, is, is, has, is just on its last um, uh, leg there, and we would, um, we would, we're, uh, Bianca Stone, um, Ruth Stone's granddaughter, and her husband, Ben Peace, have moved to Vermont from Brooklyn to um, restore the house and to uh, uh, start the Ruth Stone Foundation and try to get that house back up. Ruth's last wish was to turn that house into a writer's retreat, and so that's what we're trying to do. I'm going to just uh, read a few poems here. I'm going to start, I was trying to decide what to read, and I went for a walk by, down by my house, and the peepers were out there screaming. And I was saying, like, I asked, I asked them, what, what, should I, what should I read? And they just screamed, me, me, me. So uh, <laughs> I just happened to have written a poem about the peepers, and uh, called Frog Pond. I crept up on them, a creeper among the peepers, <laughs> and stood on the bank like a metronome and peeped myself a couple of times, then listened to their slow diminuendo until just one called out his shrill, erotic song, as if he were deaf to the sudden calm that had settled across the water, or maybe thought that he and I were so spectacular as singing partners that we could share the pond and was waiting for me to sing again, which I did, mm -hmm. I did, like the amateur I was, so human and wrong, without the others whose high professional voices drowned my drone. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> this uh, poem is in the anthology. It's, it's about uh, it's about the uh, hermit thrush. That I, which is, of course, the state bird. You know, we all know that. Um, has the most beautiful song, I think, of practically any bird I know, anyway. And it should be, well, it's a little dark now, but uh, in a few weeks we'll hear it right around this time. It's called To Hear and Hear. The hermit thrush is set for six to sing her song as if it were the end of the world and she was stirred by dusk to sing the same sweet song again and again in the understory, as if to say it's neither words nor meaning that matter in the end, but the quality of sound, as if we were deafened by the sun and needed her song as a key to unlock our ears, to hear and hear and understand, to see and see, knowing that this one day is the end for now, which it is. It is, she claims, with a song just loud enough to pierce the woods until the night descends like a thousand veils, and then just one. Um, so I'm going to read um, a couple of new ones and then end also with a kind of a new one. Uh, this um, 
poem is called The Lack. It's a skinny poem. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to read one called um, Diet. So that uh, goes with this one. The Lack. So I am feckless, I admit. For I was born without sufficient feck. <laughs> Which is why I take a supplement of it. <laughs> Along with all my other pills and stuff. Although it's never quite enough. So I digress. As a way to fuck my dearth of feck. As if a prolegomenon or plot could plug the drain of my so leaky self. And then, and afterward as well. But no, not yet. I had a dream last night in which I was enough. Blessed with a speck that tipped the scale to bliss. But lo, I couldn't sleep for long and woke to what I felt was far too much. And missed my old ironic want. So I confess, feck is more, except when it is less. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll read the diet one here. I just have to read this um, poem um, since I wrote it um, just the other day. And um, let's see, um, I'm actually on a diet, so for like 30 years. <laughs> Let me just uh, find out where this is. Um, okay. Um, how to diet? Eat your hunger. Put some sugar on it and a little butter too. Then eat it a thousand times in all its various flavors until you're so full of emptiness you could eat a thousand more. But don't, because you've allowed yourself a little morsel of celery instead. <laughs> and a radish for dessert. <laughs> to fatten your discipline. A postprandial nibble that gives you indigestion, but you chew it anyway, remembering the last cookie you had four weeks ago. <laughs> As if it were now and you're eating it again in your head, which only angers your stomach, that has captured you and is holding you hostage in a ramshackle cabin down a dirt road somewhere you hope will become famous someday as the site where you outsmarted it, your stomach, by simply keeping your mouth shut. <laughs> Despite the fact it's holding a gun to your head with your finger on the trigger, believing that you just might pull it. But I digress. Just eat it with nothing on it. It's good. You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, I'm going to uh, end with a poem. I've um, written an, a new manuscript called um, in my unknowing. I finally gotten to that point where I'm ready to just say I have no idea uh, about much of anything. Um, so this will actually be coming out next year at some point. I'm not sure the exact date, but uh, this is the first poem in this. And thanks so much, everybody. It's been wonderful to be here and to hear all these great poems tonight. In my unknowing, it's got an epigram, O taste and see, which is a psalm, Psalm 34, verse 8, and a famous line that uh, poets have used for decades and decades. Denise Levertov, I think, has a beautiful book called O taste and see. In my unknowing, I was driving through the fields of heaven when I realized I was still on earth, because earth was all I had ever known of heaven and no other place would do for living forever. I'd grown beyond belief from seeing that everything I felt had sprung from lives I'd already lived, so that I could feel the way I did, which was so much I had no idea where to begin. The crawling, the slithering, the leaping, the flying, the dying. 
If you had been there with me in the passenger seat and asked me about the newt or flea or pachyderm, I would have told you everything I knew, which was a frightening amount. And not only that, but just how much I love them all, those heavenly beings, the serpent, the lion, the mosquito, the hawk, the antelope, the worm, and not only beings, but stones as well. Each particular thing so mysterious in my unknowing, I knew I was living forever. I knew the fields through which I was driving were the fields of heaven, in which I was tasting and seeing, seeing and tasting. Thank you. Thank you.